we are now going to turn our attention to Peter Lombard. We had just spent a good amount of time talking about Abelard and his magnificent impact in the realm of philosophy and his super interesting life. Um, and the fact that he liked to ask questions and didn't always give the answers. In fact, more often than not, he just kind of left the questions open and that got him into trouble. Lombard follows after Abelard and in many ways does what Abelard should have done. He answers the questions. He not only poses the questions that we need to think about, but he answers them as well. His life isn't quite as interesting. Uh, he doesn't have the sort of torrid affairs that Abelard has, but because he answers the questions, his impact is much more direct and known. And really it's his answers to Abelard's questions that kind of become the basis of philosophical knowledge and Catholic theology throughout the medieval era. So we kind of have to have Lombard as a completion of Abelard, even if we're not spending as much time on him because he's not quite as interesting, but his ideas are more impactful because he answered those questions. The future of medieval philosophy grows out of the School of St. Victor. School of St. Victor was founded by somebody we've already talked about with the life of Abelard, and, and that's William of Champeaux, with the whole discussion of universals and his argument there. Everyone at the School of St. Victor kind of grows out of this mystical idea, but also really tries to see themselves and would identify themselves as modern. In fact, it's really at this school and at this time that the word modern first gets used, modo, uh, and then later on the term hodomene, or today's men, right? They're, they're viewing themselves as modern, even though we look back and says, you're middle ages. They, they saw themselves as modern. And this idea that we're always modern or later even postmodern kind of has this sort of philosophical thought. The idea was to shape the future of philosophy, was to engage in the dialectic. It was to engage with matters of faith and philosophy together. And Abelard was a part of all of this. He was connected with the School of St. Victor in some sort of way, uh, teaching some people tangentially, knowing them, influencing them, but not really part of that attending as obviously his confrontations with Champeau uh, wouldn't have really allowed him to flourish exactly in that environment. A couple of the heroes of the School of St. Victor briefly. The, the first is Hugh of St. Victor. He lived 1096 to 1141. He's likely from uh, Saxon origin, although there is some sort of questions and debates about all of this. He was known as the New Augustine, mainly because he was so good with his knowledge of Augustine. He also, in many ways, served as the sort of cooler for Abelard's systems. He liked Abelard, and he thought Abelard had a lot going for him. But, you know, Abelard was a, was a little brash, and so Hugh said, all right, let's, let's kind of take some of these ideas and massage them a little bit. Let's kind of promote how they can be seen in a positive way. Dialectic and theology were preserved from the sort of fears of Abelard, and Hugh will allow people like Lombard uh, shortly thereafter to have a solid footing to move on to. We also have Richard of St. Victor. Um, we don't know much about when he was born. Likely he died in 1173. Richard was probably a Scot, which means either Scottish or Irish, uh, when people identify it at this era with that. And he maintained that adequate convincing arguments could be found for the mysteries of faith. These two, along with several others that will emerge out of the school of St. Victor, really helped to shape the new era, incorporating Abelard, but preserving many of his ideas without all of the challenges that go along with Abelard. This finally brings us to Peter Lombard, who really in many ways 
synthesizes and learns from all that there can be at the school of St. Victor. Abelard, Lombard, the whole school, everyone involved themselves again, saw themselves as modern and on the forefront of a new era. And the shape of this era came from these men and what they were doing. Along with Anselm, Abelard, and St. Victor, we're going to eventually get the form of scholasticism. And with Lombard, we're going to get the basic textbook of this school on how that's going to be moved forward. The form of scholasticism is fairly simple and straightforward, but this is what it is. It's first to gather patristic sources and scripture. You're going to get all of your primary sources. You're going to line them all up. Then you're going to figure out what the key ideas or dogmas are through rational speculation. You're going to look at it and you're going to say, this is what's good. This is what's worth discussing. You're going to investigate these ideas using dialectic, right? That, that question answering sort of model that we saw with Anselm that exists throughout this era. You should, moving forward, sorry, Abelard, give the answers to your questions. You're going to establish dogma from these answers using dialectical reasoning. You're going to use philosophical understanding to demonstrate the rational character of these dogmas. And notice here we have this sort of synthesis of, of theology and philosophy, that, that one is used in service for the other. That's why when you read uh, Aquinas, it was very much like, okay, this seems to be the completion of what this idea is, right? You have this major theological question and you're addressing it through this dialectical philosophical way. Finally, the goal is to apply when necessary these rational dogmas to a variety of issues, addressing the nature of God, man, ethics, reason, anything really that you can find a good way to apply it for. And Lombard really is the champion of this. He, he's the one who does this the right way. Um, he's sometimes, by the way, called Peter of Lombard or the Lombard. Uh, he was born in near Novare in Lombardy, uh, likely educated uh, in Bologna and Reims. He will attend the school of St. Victor and was most likely a pupil of Abelard, right? So he gets all of this perfect sort of education right you're well connected you get the how to do it right from the school of saint victor you get the challenging of richard and hugh along with shampoo uh, and yet you also get the just brilliant mind and ideas of abelard all adding on to here so peter lombard's really teed off for just perfect success and and he has a good drive he, he hits he hits a long ball Right, so he does well with that. Um, Bernard, who didn't like Abelard, did like Lombard and recommended him for a benefice, a, a job that would pay him, that he can live off of. Um, he went to school on a scholarship is, is kind of what that also means, which actually might make us like Lombard a little bit more because that meant he likely came from a poor family, that he was just kind of smart, a little more humble-minded, especially in comparison to Abelard. Uh, and his brilliance is what advanced him instead of his connections in any way. Uh, in 1140, he taught at the Cathedral School of Paris, Notre Dame, and he was made Bishop of Paris in 1159. He dies likely the next year around 1160, we think. We don't know exactly, but it, that seems to be roughly one. So he's briefly the Bishop of Paris before he dies. His writings, uh, primarily we know him through the Psalms and commentaries on these Psalms and Paul. Uh, he gathered a collection of scripture sources and works of the fathers to address issues raised by Psalms and Paul. And this will grow into his monumental work, what's known as the Four Books of Sentences. The Four Books of Sentences is the textbook of medieval philosophy. We don't know medieval philosophy or how it would have gone if it wasn't for these four books, but nearly every great philosophical work, we've already talked about Aquinas and Bonaventure and many others, grew out of commentaries on the four books of sentences. Now, it's not just 
a list of sentences, right? The four books of theological questions that are organized according to a general order of things and signs is the official, you know, broad name on how this would be identified. The four books, first one deals with God and God's attributes. The second treats creation, the fall, the history before the incarnation. The third deals with the incarnation, redemption, and Christ the Redeemer. Uh, and fourth studies signs or sacraments, as well as death, judgment, hell, heaven, etc. Um, each follow a logical order, whereas many collections of questions before and even after Lombard kind of looked at the order of the biblical text, which you know, is kind of a little scattered, a little here, a little there. You're going to pick one source out of one place and out of another, and you don't get this whole like straight, well, how do we address the issue of the atonement or the incarnation or whatever? And, and so what Lombard does is he puts them all in a straightforward, hey, we're going to address this in this way. In many ways, it follows a very similar structure to Sick It Non, uh, yes and no, with one clear difference between Lombard and Abelard, and, and that's one I've already mentioned, that Lombard gives the answers. It, it's really, you know, you, you can't understate how important that giving of the answers is. The work opens with a question, brings in different authorities, councils, church fathers, scripture, etc., uh, for and against the subject, then answers this issue uh, and, and resolves it. And very much we see the same pattern kind of exemplified in the Summa Theologica of Aquinas. Um, and again, the Summa is a commentary on the sentences. And so it makes sense that this becomes the standard sort of way. Um, and it also answers those questions, which becomes extremely important. The purpose of the four books of sentences was not only to find or explain the truth through a dialectical method, it was also to teach morals. And this is the issue of didactic. So we have the method of dialectic and we have the purpose of didactic. Teaching uh, here where the material addresses the topic and then reviews correct responses to it. This includes usually having a moral or a set objective beneath the text and helps to explain what's going on. The point is to provide a deeper knowledge of the subject in the singular and provides a direction for this topic uh, and how you should read the event, the story, the church father, or whatever in the future. Here Lombard demonstrates a synthesis of both Abelard and the school of St. Victor, that he ends up giving us the best of all the worlds when he's producing the four books of sentences. An example of the didactic in the work uh, is found from sentence 318, section uh, 3. Question is, why was Eve taken from Adam's rib? Why? Why the rib? Why not the foot or the head becomes the question that's introduced at this point. Could be that, you know, it, why not an arm? Why not anything, right? What, where should this come from? Why a rib? Why was that being used? Lombard tells us that the rib demonstrates that Eve is man's equal, his constant companion, not a servant like the foot or the master like the head. One could even further extrapolate, though Lombard does not do this, that it also might show that she's close to his heart and all of that sort of symbolism attached with that. Right. So the text not only explains this biblical account, but also provides a future basis on the discussion of marriage, which should also then go on to address the church and its relationship to Christ as the church is Christ's bride. And so we get further explanation off of this singular event it's also going to point out that the church is then born out of the wounds of Christ or the side wounds of Christ. Ideas that are extrapolated a little greater by St. Francis, uh, as well as a whole host of others who will follow him. 
Angelina da Foligno also develops a little bit of a side wound theology. And even into the early modern era, uh, amongst Protestants, you get uh, Zizendorf develops a whole side wound theology. And so you can kind of grow this same example for application. And we kind of see people doing that as time goes by. So we're expanding on all this and we're able to see certain connections and, and Adam slept for the rib to be removed and Christ slept upon the cross for the church to be born, for his bride to emerge. And so we have all of these further examples of here, let's take this one little verse and let's expand it. Let's What's the moral of it? What can we learn in a broader sense from this instead of simply accepting one thing as it is? It really cannot be understated the importance of the four books of sentences. Within 20 years, it's the basis for commentaries. By the 1230s, it's the standard textbook for all schools. Alexander of Hales introduced Lombard sentences as, as the official textbook for the theology faculty at Paris, which is the preeminent school of philosophy during this time. English might want to object but they can't uh, right? that, that just the level of importance throughout medieval era paris is the, the school the pinnacle of philosophical education and anyone who wanted to become a master in theology had a choice of writing either a commentary on the bible uh peter commonstore's history of scholasticism or Lombard sentences. Most chose the sentences, and this is a practice that lasted into the 16th century. This is the question that raised many of the doctrinal and philosophical questions that all later medieval philosophy and even early modern philosophy is looking back on or reacting to, or reacting to somebody who addressed something in this work. At Oxford and Paris, theology degrees also required spending four years teaching on the Bible and two years teaching on the sentences. Your master's degree required an additional two years on the Bible and one additional year on the sentences. It's seen as that important. There are more copies and commentaries on the sentences than any other book between 1150 and 1500, except for, of course, the Bible. Aquinas' Summa didn't catch up to the number of copies of commentaries for about 300 years after it did. It's only really into that 1600 era. Until then, this book is the one that you're going to address. Every good library was seen to have a copy of the sentences. Uh, over 200 commentaries uh, were in England, over 150 of which are written by Dominicans. Um, and this was done in a variety of different ways. Early on, they were used to introduce theology students to the various questions that Lombard treated. Later, it becomes the framework for those in training to develop their own positions on each of those questions. So you might read it, that same example that we talked about before, and say, no, uh, the rib shows the, the closeness to the heart. And you might start with, uh, Lombard's commentary and then add something else and develop the notion of love and, and what that means to be close to the one that you love and how this is, you know, the notions of romantic love might grow out of this text instead. But you're using this work as the framework for that discussion. Still, even later, it was treated more elastically and commentators were allowed to select questions that they'd consider most important and even to adjust to the working of the questions to meet new challenges. And commentaries on the sentences persisted up until about the 17th century. Peter O'Reilly, a 14th century Franciscan commentator in Paris, said that the sentences, you can learn a great number of things in theology. You can become an expert logician, a solid metaphysician, very learned in the texts of scripture, wise in the knowledge of the texts of the fathers, and you can also learn theology in the proper sense of the term. It, in many ways, is seen as fixing Abelard because, again, it gives those answers, right? 
approving notions of the incarnation. The sentences also came under suspicion from those who didn't like the dialectic practice uh, a few times, anti-dialecticians as they were known, but it will win the day. Uh, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, which we've addressed already with other major events, right? It declared that it's traditional doctrine against Joachim of Floria, who was trying to challenge it. Some ideas like adoptionism and charity associated with the Holy Spirit uh, were kind of dropped from this work, but generally seen it's as the standard Catholic theology uh, throughout the Middle Ages. It's the beginning point of philosophical speculation and what's necessary to earn your degree in philosophy or theology. It further clarified Catholic theology. The debate on faith and reason that existed uh, here he demonstrated the balance between Anselm and Abelard, that we have this sort of middle ground that can exist. It combined logic and devotional commitment. It said that the dilemmas of faith were to be resolved by reason. Right, so we don't just accept dogma, but you accept dogma as rational, as reasonable, which is very much borrowing on the import of Abelard. Uh, so we, again, we can't have Lombard without Abelard and the impact and the completion of what Lombard does is kind of in direct response to this. That any dilemmas of faith are reasonable, that you need to look at them through reason. Quote, no sufficient knowledge of the Trinity can be had, he wrote, nor could it be had without the relation of doctrine or inward inspiration. That did not mean that nothing could be said on the subject. He hastened to add, things that we can see help us understand invisible things. And so we're able to understand the invisible things from these visible things. Also, why for Catholics are there seven sacraments? Eastern theology, Eastern uh, Orthodox Christians don't have a set number of sacraments. But here for Catholics, it's just seen as natural that there are seven sacraments seven virtues, seven vices, or deadly sins. We, we, we have this number of seven, a number of completion. Why was this seen just natural for Catholics today? That's because it grows out of Lombard and, and his attraction to this. Lombard says this is the number that we need a set number of these things, that it's logical and, and rational to have these. Uh, and so that is why there are seven books of sentences. There's seven sacraments in the four books of sentences. Now, a, a further example of the four books of sentences, instead of just that, that one little article about Adam and Eve in the rib, um, where we can kind of see this, this practice of dialectic uh, and possibly even didactic in, in greater extent. Book three, distinction 10, chapter one, whether Christ is, as a man is a person or a something. So this is the, the, the question. Now notice here, we're going to apply philosophical speculation to what is already going to be agreed upon. This isn't really a, a question for open-ended debate. The fourth council, uh, the council of Chalcedon settled this issue by saying that Christ was man, was, was a human. So we're not gonna say that he's a something. And so we already have this, right? We, we've already defined this through ecclesial channels, but this is a, a work that's addressing things from a philosophical standpoint. We're not just going to say, therefore we're done, but we're gonna look at why. This is what the one time uh, future Bishop uh, of Paris will, is trying to do. He says it is often asked, by certain people, whether Christ as man is a person or whether he is a something. Is he not quite a person, right? The arguments on both sides of the question agree that he is a person they proclaim for these reasons, right? So we already have the answer, he's a person, but let's, let's figure out why he's a person. If as a man, he is a something, he is either a person or a substance or something else. But he is not something else. We don't have another category of what to say. 
that this doesn't work. Therefore, he's a person or a substance. So that, that final, like, who knows, we're, we're going to dismiss that. So if he's a substance, he's either rational or irrational. So even if we're going to go with the substance, like instead of the person argument, he's either rational or irrational as a substance, right? So where do we go with that? But he's not an irrational substance. He showed rationality. Therefore, he's rational. And, and that means that he's a rational man, which we define largely as a notion of a person. And you can kind of just leave it there. If we were Abelard going down this way, we'd probably have stopped right here and said, well, therefore, you all know the answer. But Lombard has learned from Babelard, he, he's giving the answer. He's, the, for, he's continuing to draw us, his audience, where we're needing to go step by step. Right, we've accepted these uh, earlier assertions, so we have to, we're required to accept the conclusion as well. He's answering these questions through this dialectic approach. If, as a man, he's a rational substance, then he is a person. Because that is the definition of a person, a rational substance of an individual nature. So here's your answer. It's clear as day, but I'm going to give you this answer. I'm going to spell it out, right? If, therefore, as man, he is something, he is as man is a person. Right? So even if we want to say that he is a something, he's also a person. So the debate kind of falls aside. He also, you know, does a very good job providing definitions for his terms that you can either accept his definition, which usually is coming from another authority. So you're not just arguing with him, but with somebody else, which would mean that you're disagreeing with that other authority. And presumably you hold that other person, that other authority in common, or you accept his conclusion based on the definitions of his terms. So again, it's, it's brilliant dialectic work. I'm asking the questions, I'm giving the answers. I'm leading you where we're needing to go. And this is a, a great form of argument. But conversely, if as man, he continues, he is a person, either he is the third person of the Trinity or another person, but he is not another person. Therefore, he is the third person of the Trinity. But if as man, he's the third person of the Trinity, then he is God. Right, so we're adding on even more to this, right? That we're adding that as a man, he's not only a man, but he's also God because of his connection with the Trinity. So again, he, he's philosophically addressing the dogmas that are laid out in the Ecumenical Council at Chalcedon. He's saying this is why we are left with this conclusion, and now we all have to accept it. So this is an example of how the four books of sentences is written and how it's supposed to be read. You can see here a lot of different avenues for further debate and discussion. Uh, and this is what he's wanting you to do. This is why it becomes such a great textbook because, all right, well, let's define rational, right? You might break off onto a, a, a commentary on what does rational mean? What does individual mean? What does man mean, right? All of these different sort of ideas, we can write a commentary on them and expand and expand, which people like Bonaventure and Aquinas and, and many others do uh, throughout all of the medieval era and early modern as well. So today we quickly ran through the life of Peter Lombard and his contribution to philosophy, which in many ways is that sort of completion of the ideas of Abelard. He gives the answers, but he also moves things forward. He ends up providing a work that becomes the foundation for medieval philosophy. Commentaries on his work, reading of the work. This is what's held in common in Western medieval philosophy. Everyone will know Lombard. Every library will have a copy of his sentences. Well, his life might not have been as exciting as Abelard, his contribution becomes that sort of foundation. But we also wouldn't really have Lombard if it wasn't for the brilliance of people like Abelard, who showed how to do it and maybe do it a little bit wrong so you can correct it. Uh, you answer, ask these questions, let me answer them. Let's make sure we're all on the same page moving forward. Uh, and Lombard does that for us.